Hello, my name is Isaiah and welcome to another review at overclockersclub.com and this is our YouTube channel of course. Today I'm going to review the G-Skill Trident Z Neo memory kit. Here's the box right there and the memory's in the computer. Now this is a 3600 memory kit that is optimized for Ryzen and in this review I'm going to talk about really to maximize your potential out of this out of the CPU you always want to have your F clock match your memory so 3600 is a very good example of already pretty optimized for the Ryzen generation before we actually dive into that review portion of it I want to talk about the voltages of course now for memory in general I like to stay below 1.5 volts or 1.5 volts and below um, you can go above this for DDR4 memory 1.6, 1.7, 1.8 uh, but it's not good for daily use you're going to burn out the memory eventually whether it's tomorrow, today, five minutes, one hour, one week it, there's no clear answer to that some memory is more susceptible to degrading faster at higher voltage other ones work until they just stop working so I like to stick to 1.5 volts that is the maximum I'm going to go for daily use for reviews I do this because I don't believe reviews that push the memory to the limits is a good example of using it in a computer now if you want to set records go for it you can probably do 1.8 volt on lots of different Samsung BDI memory and get a lot better results but I'm not going to do that. I don't want to destroy the memory and of course you're buying this memory based on my review because you want something good for your system and used every day not just one off. So that is the memory. Now the voltage for the SOC which is the system on chip which is part of the Infinity Fabric mainframe kind of deal for the Ryzen CPUs. I like to stick below 1.2 like everybody else. It is safe to go to 1.2 volts for the SOC if uh, you don't mind losing the PCIe 4.0 speeds. Now, I don't think you ever need to put that much voltage into your system. I stuck around 1.125 is kind of where I'm at. I'm not comfortable going too much higher than that just because high voltage can degrade the CPU. And for daily use, I never found a use to going above that speed because my F clock is maxed out at 1900 megahertz. Raising SOC doesn't help me go higher than that, so there's no point in putting more voltage into it. Okay, so we're going to kick off the portion of the review that covers the benchmarks. First up, we need to know is the system I'm using. All this can be found in the written article, but for those who just want to watch the YouTube video, I am using a Ryzen 3800X all core at 4.3 gigahertz, Asus X570 Hero, and a NVIDIA RTX 280 Super. Above that is the memory sub timings and the amount of memory I'm using for each kit. So it's very important to pay attention to that, especially later on in the review you'll see. So as example, Corsair Dominar Platinum 3200 is a 32 gigabyte kit, whereas the Trident Z Neo, which I'm reviewing this memory is 16 gigs total. So it's very important to take note of that. On to the actual results here. This is a Nino 1800 and it's running at 1280 by 720 resolution average frame rate. And the reason why we have such a low resolution is because we want to be CPU bound and not GPU bound. That means that the CPU is the limitation here on frame rate, not the video card. So really, it doesn't matter what video card you use if you're going to do kind of uh, benchmarks like this. But you need to be it so the CPU is the limitation, not the GPU. And you'll get res varying results like this. This is to show you that memory speed can dictate the frame rate. Now, it might be a very small difference when you get to a higher resolution, but when it's just a CPU limiting which some games are very CPU oriented, other ones are more GPU oriented. A lot of AI physics and all that would be CPU. If you have a lot of graphics on the screen, it's going to be GPU. Sometimes a mix of two. But basically, what I'm getting at here is that if you're strictly limited by the CPU, then this chart shows you the differences between the memory kits and what is important. Right off the bat, you see the Trident Z Nero 3600 out of the box stock settings is almost the best memory kit I have 
tested. And then when I overclock it to 3800 and tighten the timings up quite a bit to about the best I've ever done ever for any kit, it exceeds and excels everything. It's pretty amazing. So if you're buying this memory for video games, definitely you want to set it for 3800 if you're into overclocking it. Now, if you leave it stock, it's still pretty good, but overclocking is going to be better. Next up is ADA64, and this is going to cover the memory latency and read and write following graphs. Now, this has really no impact on, I would say, day-to-day -day applications. This is just kind of raw data for those who are interested. And you can see that lower is better, so the lower your latency is, the quicker it talks to the memory controller, to the CPU and all that. By having it lower, you technically are able to transfer more data more often, I guess is a nice way of saying it. But um, it's not super important, but you can see here that both the 3600 stock and the overclocked are both the top contenders here for memory latency on this motherboard. Now continuing with ADA64 is their write speed. This is megabytes per second. And if you can see here, they're kind of grouped together. So 3200, 3600, and 3800. And the reason for this is that your memory speed should be tied to your F clock for best results. So therefore the timings don't matter too much when it comes to raw write speed. This is this is a peak write speed. ADA64 looks at the peak amount, not the sustained amount. 3800 peaks at about 30,000 megabytes per second. 4400 is actually lower because the F clock is lower. So you're getting a latency penalty for having memory that's no longer a one-to-one -one ratio. That's breaking the ratio. And therefore you can see the write speed is lower. Next is a read megabytes per second with ADA64. And you can see that read is a little bit different than write. Performance does kind of dictate based on your latency. Only the lower your latency is, the better you have for read speed because the more often it can access the memory, the lower your latency is, the more you can access your memory. It's kind of, that's how it goes. So out of the box, Trident Z3600 is at 50,000, very good number. And then when you push it to the limits, which I have, have here at 3800 with a very tight timings you get 55,000 and this is peak performance once again this is not sustained next up is blender is a 3d rendering program open source and free to use very very popular among people that are just getting into um, 3d making and they don't have a lot of money to spend also some professionals do use it though it's kind of mixed together some people love it some people hate it but anyways this is blender i'm using the open data benchmark for victor it's the one with a guy and he has a sheep on the screen anyways it takes about 16 minutes across the board, almost 17 minutes for the Viper blackout memory. And then the fastest memory seems to tie around 16 minutes and 10 seconds. This is minutes, of course. You can see here that faster memory does help, but really the timings are the ones that kind of dictate it. And if you see, if you really look into it, it doesn't really matter. And it's mostly, this is a based on error. If you can, if you do like a 5% margin error, you're pretty much gonna be within the realm of all of them except for the slowest, which is the Viper Blackout 3600. Last up is Adobe Premiere. Now this is a project I used for the Crosshair Dominator Platinum memory, the video that's on YouTube, I can link it below. This is from that project, this is the render. The file project size is about 25 gigabytes. When it goes into encoding mode, it uses about 17 gigabytes in the memory. The benefit here is you can see that generally, all the memory kits that are 32 gigabytes are ahead by almost two minutes. With the one exception is that the Trident Z Neo 3800 has such low timings that it kind of contends with the higher end memory or higher density memory, I should say. When it comes to video encoding, more memory is very useful. If you're buying this memory kit solely for video encoding, I highly suggest buying more memory, higher density than faster memory. Not to say that this memory can't do it. As you see here, the Trident Z Neo 3800 when it's overclocked is exceptionally good. It's matching everything else, but for less money, you can get 32 gigabytes and you'll lower your rendering time. All right, so that wraps up the benchmarks. Let's move on to the software. All right, so you see I have opened the software and let's go ahead and play around with it. Now, if you sync to LEDs, what it's gonna do is supposedly 
sync to the motherboard. Now why it does red, I don't know. But it doesn't change the motherboard itself. Um, you can pick static colors, you can pick one LED if you want. Which is pretty cool. But this memory is not that exciting. Of course you can tell it to breathe, strobing, comet, starry night. There's lots of different things here. Anyways, so the, the actual memory itself from the G-Skill software is pretty lame. There's, you can control it from the motherboard software, which I'm about to do here. It is kind of finicky too. See, it turned red again. And you see I lost complete control over the memory. I don't want to break these. Let's try this again. So it's motherboard. You can use the software on the motherboard, but you can't set single colors. Like each LED you can't set individually. You can only set the whole motherboard. And as you see, the motherboard does act correctly to this. Psycho color, let's go this one. And you see how the memory itself rapidly changes compared to the case. Which really leaves me that the actual best settings for the memory is a static color if you're gonna use the motherboard software. And here you go, you got red. And that concludes the memory software. It's not very exciting. It's pretty boring. Okay, so here's the memory. It is the Trident Z style. And if you compare it to this non-RGB memory, it still has the same plastic brace in the middle. And uh, it comes out the same way. And then of course, both sides now this is a double-sided memory, and that kind of gives it a little bit more weight. But, you know, honestly not much. You really not. The weight is not going to be determined by the chips. They're not very big, but um, the 16 gig, which is or 16 gig right here, both sides have IC chips on it. And this one side has chips and one side has foam. Usually the foam is on the side that doesn't have the barcode. So we're gonna try to get this apart. And my experience is with this kind of memory, um, it doesn't come apart very easily. So just like my other videos, I don't suggest actually doing this unless you really wanna see what's inside of it, but you're gonna avoid your warranty and there's no reason to actually open your memory for any reason unless you're doing a review. Um, you can see what type of memory it is online, like, you know, if it's Samsung or Micron or anything like that, you can see online, or software, there's no reason to open your memory up to find out what it, what supposedly it is. Okay, that's the wrong side. Yeah. Okay, these really don't budge at all, so let's go ahead, and I... I know this because I tried to open these up before and I haven't been able to either. So let's go ahead and grab the trusty hair dryer. Took a lot of effort. The glue is pretty good. Now, I already took this stick apart because um, for the written part, I had to retake it apart for the video. So there's a few fingerprints on it already. But getting out and off is the same process. Once you put the little heat spreader back on, the glue is pretty, or at least the thermal tape 
pads is sticky enough that it's not coming apart. On top of that, what really kind of secures it together is this little plastic bit because both sides has a little hook and then it has these little tabs here or little, I don't know what they are, little bumps. And so as it basically, as it slots in, well, actually, probably you should see on this one, as it slots in, this side grips and this side grips. So both sides are gripping the heat spreader and then little pegs are kind of right there and there's another one right there. And uh, that really makes it so it's not coming apart. Now we actually see the memory. Um, this is going to be an A2 layout. So the IC chips are far apart. And this is also, if I look at the part number, it is Samsung BTI. Another interesting note here is that the little LED lights, uh, half are on one side, the other half are on the other side. Now I couldn't actually, I did this before, but I couldn't get the other side off without physically damaging it because it has this, it has this foam pad and the foam pad is basically pretending to be IC chips which is good news because there's no re reason to take the other side off. I did want to see the little controller that makes these LEDs work, um, but I'm not going to ruin a stick of memory, especially good kind of memory, um, to find out what the little IC chip looks like. I suspect it's up here somewhere, but um, I can't see it. I can only guess it's on the other side of the memory. It's possible that it's somewhere in the middle on the other side, but it doesn't matter. Either way, Samsung memory, Samsung B die memory, and then the LEDs are only on one side here and then the other side here. So when it lights up, only half the stick lights up on one and the other half lights up. Interesting um, way to do it. Now that we have taken apart the memory, let's go ahead and move on to, well, I don't know, I guess the conclusion, because this should be the end of the review here. If I chop this video up together, this is pretty much the ending. Now we can see what it looks like. So I'll see you in the conclusion. So we talked about the memory overclocking. We talked about the software. We took apart the memory and kind of see how it looks. Now, when it comes to actually wrapping up the review, I like to tell people I'm not a fan of giving stars or scores or whatever, because Memory is a very picky, subjective subject. Uh, people are buying memory because they want the looks of it and they don't care about the quote-unquote performance because you may not gain any performance from the fastest memory on the planet versus the slow memory because it depends on what application you're using and what game you're using. And I wrote that in my article about memory scaling for Ryzen, and I think people already have taken that too hard, maybe too much, and taking it to two extremes. I'm not saying that memory speed doesn't matter. I'm just saying that if your system is bound by other means, so if you're if you're playing at resolution is high enough that your video card is struggling, faster speed memory is not going to help there because the GPU is CPU is bound. If you have a CPU is like four core, two core, or whatever you're, you're using, more cores might not help. And the same goes for faster memory might not help. So it's kind of a runabout way of saying, I can't tell you if this memory is going to be better for your scenario, but I can tell you that if it, if you just blindly want to buy memory and you want the best performance, whether it may or may not affect you for every game, this is the memory kit you want to get. The reason for that is because this memory is 3,600 out of the box. CL14 and then sometimes for 1515 or so. This means your F clock is running at 1800 megahertz, which is more or less the limit of most CPUs for the Ryzen 3 third generation. It can go higher if you put more voltage into it. If you leave it stock voltage, you won't go higher. Uh, not all CPUs are created equal. And when you go above 1800, you have to put a lot of work into it. So just say 1900 and go, it's not gonna boot half the time. It depends on the motherboard, depends on the CPU, depends on your voltages, all those that play a factor in it. If you are somebody that wants to go to 1900, well, you're in luck because this memory also overclocks just fine 
3800, which is 1900 F block. Um, that's why this memory kit is especially good. It's more or less plug and play. You put the memory sticks in, you enable XMP profile, and then your memory is running at 3600 and your F block is at 1800, which is pretty much optimal for Ryzen without fiddling with any voltages or anything like that. Now, the memory itself, we already talked about the lighting and the software. It's not honestly the best. I've seen better lighting from other companies and I've seen better software from other companies. And those other companies, well, the top one I would ever say is going to be Corsair's Dominator memory, the Platinum Edition. These memory sticks, I talked about in that review, is that the lighting and the software is amazing and that's what you're paying for. It's always subjective because not everybody likes the same kind of lighting. I just feel that the G-Skill memory lighting is eh. I've seen it before, it doesn't really blow my mind. And the software is really weak, if I am being honest. Um, it didn't like to work properly. It doesn't like to sync with any of the software. There's no there's no lighting for the motherboard or any that, it doesn't work. So you're limited to using that software just for lighting and then using your motherboard software to do the rest of the lighting for your case and uh, peripherals and all that. But the problem is sometimes they conflict and then it'll overwrite each other and all that. So really the lighting is not the best. That being said, if you're buying this memory because you just want to leave it on RGB mode and, or just a static color, which your motherboard software can control, if you want 3600 memory with the 1800 F clock to match each other, this memory kit is amazing out of the box. You really can't ask for more without playing around the settings. And that's exactly what I did. I was able to raise it to 183800, which is 1900 F clock. And I got the subtitings down to still CL14, but all the sub other subtitings went to 1313, 2740, and it's still at T1 and still at 1.5 volts, which is actually really good. Now it can go lower, but that's when I started putting a fan on it. And I think for most users, you're putting you're not putting a fan on it because you are using it for daily use. You're putting a fan on it because you're trying to set some records or overclocking and all that. I think if anybody ever walks up to me and says, Isaiah, what is a really good memory for Ryzen platform? And I say, well, if you're on the third generation, you want the G-Skill Neo memory. Now, if you're on the second generation, first generation CPUs, they do sell lower bin memory kits with tight timings on it, but it doesn't really stand out to me because there's a lot of other brands that do exactly the same thing. So the Neo kit really stands out when you're doing the third generation 3600 memory, memory or 3800 memory, both those kits are substantially better than anything else you can get on the market right now. All right, so that concludes this review. I ramble a little bit, I know that. So let's wrap this up really quickly. Thank you for, for watching this video. Please subscribe, please give a thumbs up. And if you have any questions or comments, go on to forums, overclockersclub.com. We'll leave a question for anything. Um, there's always great members on there who can help. You can leave a comment in the video. I'll try my best to look at it. And definitely check out more videos from Chris. He does cases, coolers, anything you can think of. He's always reviewing stuff here. So once again, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.